Welcome, everyone. Very pleased to have so many of you with us here today. For to, uh, This is CDR. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals Open Air has under development for New York and other states and jurisdictions. Um, first of all, everyone, many of you have, but please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. My name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work with Open Air on CDR policy policy advocacy. Just some quick background on open air. We're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, our growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy, research and development, and carbon removal market development. Um, we need all the help we can get. It's a really fun group to be a part of, and please, uh, I encourage you to join us. Uh, Chris Nidal, who is our founder, will put a link in the chat and um, uh, give us check us out. So to, we're here to talk about carbon removal, and you know, I think first of all, and up front, it's really important to define what carbon removal is. Um, carbon removal and this definition comes straight from the Bible of CDR, uh, the Carbon Dioxide Removal Primer. Um, carbon removal. Uh, comprise activities that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. When we talk about carbon removal, as we're doing today and with the series, it's really important and critical and essential, first and foremost, to emphasize that CDR is not in any way an alternative to reducing emissions. We must reduce global emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible. That's a full stop there. That said, every credible climate forecast, including in very stark terms, um, the most recent IPCC assessment report indicate that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century. That's billions of tons per year to counteract those emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate. And ultimately, we're going to need to start removing the tremendous excess trillions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere. If you're new to CDR, um, our previous This is CDR sessions, this is now our 23rd um, great resource. Um, Chris will also put a few other um, resources in the chat. DOE, led by uh, Jennifer Wilcox, has a great set of resources about CDR that are very approachable, a great place to start. I mentioned the CDR primer and, again, the videos from the This is CDR session. Um, I'd like to hand it over now to our uh, special guest co-host, the inventor of Siam, um, Doll Winners, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about the today's run of show and introduce um, our very exciting speakers. Doll? Yes. Well, thank you so much, Toby. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am the, uh, as Toby mentioned, the inventor of Open Air's low cost open hardware, small scale carbon mineralization unit called Cyan. I'm also CTO of Deep Science, a company developing biocomposites for science, carbon storage, and carbon removal applications. I'm really pleased to co host this event and to welcome our notable speakers in the carbon mineralization space today. Some housekeeping notes. Our format will be a 15 to 20 minute presentation followed by a few prepared questions, then moderated audience Q&A. So please type any questions you have into Zoom's Q&A box as we go along and not the chat. This event is being recorded. We will send the video link to everyone who registered and also post Open Air's website and YouTube channel. We'll also be live tweeting today's event. We'll put our Twitter link in the chat. So please follow along, and if you tweet, the event hashtag is this is CDR. And now for the main event. This week on This is CDR, we are pleased to welcome Max Scholten and Noah McQueen to talk about Heirloom's innovative DAP technology that enhances the Earth's natural mineralization processes to create a cost-effective and highly scalable CDR pathway. And a bit about our presenters who are on the screen there. Max is the head of commercialization at Heirloom, he has spent the last 10 years building software, hardware, and robotics in financial services and autonomous vehicles. Before Heirloom, he was responsible for bringing to market Nero's delivery service with some of the world's largest partners, including Kroger, Walmart, Domino's, and CBS. At Heirloom, he oversees the go-to market policy and functions. Noah is a co-founder and head of research at Heirloom. NOAA's expertise surrounds carbon capture and removal with a focus on carbon mineralization technologies and direct air capture systems. This includes pro process design alongside the use of both techno-economic analyses and life cycle assessments to evaluate the technical and economic feasibility of carbon removal systems. 
Noah holds a PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and a BS in chemical engineering from Colorado School of Mines. Presenters, welcome today. Um, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and to talk to all of you. So <clears throat> let me pull up some slides here. Awesome. So yeah, as, uh, as you just heard, we are, we are Heirloom. Uh, I'm, I'm Max. Very nice to meet you all. Really excited to share more about what we're working on and, and how we're thinking about CDR. Um, we are uh, here, both of us in, in San Francisco. Uh, we have our headquarters in the dog patch where we're, we're building this stuff. So uh, super excited to share more. Um, at its core, we have an incredibly simple mission. Uh, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, open air and, and this is CDR, we are a, truly a CDR company. We wanna remove as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as possible. Um, we're aiming to remove a billion tons of CO2 per year from the atmosphere by 2035 incredibly ambitious goal, but uh, it, it has to happen. And, and so we are uh, laser focused on making it happen. I wanna talk a little bit about first sort of why we're doing this and, and the impetus behind the company and, um, and, and uh, you know, our drive to make this happen. The, you know, something shifted in, in 2018. Uh, in 2018, the IPCC released their special report on one and a half degrees warming. Uh, in that report, it it was made abundantly clear that, you know, as, as we just heard it, halting greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is just not enough to achieve our warming targets. It's, it's not an, it's not an either or now it's, uh, it's decarbonization and carbon removal. We need to figure out how to remove billions and billions and billions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere in order to, to achieve our, uh, in order to achieve our one and a half or two degree targets. The one and a half one is, is going to be extremely difficult, but even that two and a half, two degree target, uh, we, we really need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And I think this, you know, th this chart is a, is a clear indication of, uh, of exactly that, right? In order to, to rapidly, rapidly solve this problem, we need to decarbonize every sector of our economy, um, but we also need ultra low cost, scalable and permanent carbon removal. Um, the, the IPCC estimates we'll need around 10 billion tons of CO2 removal each year by the end of the century to achieve our targets. Um, the solutions out there today are just not sufficient to handle that problem. Um, so that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a solution that will do this permanently at low cost um, and, and address both legacy emissions and ongoing emissions from hard to abate industries. Those hard to abate industries are a big reason why we're, we're doing this, right? There are all sorts of essential, essential things to human life that we, we need to continue using. We need to continue building things. We need to continue eating. Um, we need to continue shipping things around the world in order to, to have, uh, you know, uh, to, to live as humans. And so these are things that are going to be especially hard to decarbonize and, and ones that, uh, direct air capture and carbon dioxide removal are especially well suited to, to solve. Um, we're, we're still expected to, and, and hopefully this is not true, but still expected to, to be emitting 16 gigatons of, of CO2 per year by 2050 from hard to abate sectors. So how do we handle cement, iron and steel, plastic, agriculture, trucking, shipping, aviation? Obviously we have to focus on decarbonizing them, but for those hardest to decarbonize emissions, direct air capture is and, and carbon dioxide removal are solutions that will help us get to that net zero target. So again, I shared this already, but but our mission is, is a simple one. We want to remove a billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere by 2035. Uh, we're going to scale well beyond that into the 2040s and 2050s and, and hopefully be doing a significant, significant chunk of that, that 10 gigatons by the end of the end of the century. But that's our goal. Um, and so I'll, I'll turn it over to Noah here to talk a little bit more about the sort of origin story of, of Heirloom and, and talk more a little bit, a little bit more about exactly how we're accomplishing this. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Um, so Heirloom's technology is co-invented by some of the world's leading experts in both direct air capture and carbon mineralization. Um, namely, they include Professor Jennifer Wilcox, who is a leading expert on all things direct air capture, wrote the book on carbon capture, um, she's professor at the, or currently on leave as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania to serve at the Department of Energy. 
And additionally, Peter Kellerman who, of Columbia University, who is a prominent expert in carbon mineralization as a climate mitigation pathway. Um, in addition to the co-inventors, um, we are also building a team. Our team is 30 plus experts that come from deeply experienced industrial automation backgrounds. Uh, our CEO, Shashank, is a former co-founder or is of Tempo Automation, which is an electronics uh, manufacturer with computer chips that are on satellites, rockets, medical devices, autonomous vehicles, and even the Mars rover. The rest of our team uh, comes from some of the best hardware and automation companies in the world, like Tesla and SpaceX, Apple and Google, as, and more. Um, and our research team also comes from some of the best universities, Berkeley, Columbia University, the University of Pennsylvania. Our uh, funding, our funders and investors uh, include some of the world's best climate investors, including Bill Gates's backed Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Prelude Ventures, and Lower Carbon Capital, uh, alongside grant funding from agencies like RPE and the National Science Foundation. So now that we've kind of hyped up all of the people supporting this uh, and some of the origin of Heirloom, what do we do? So we are building a low cost direct air capture system that uses carbon mineralization to capture CO2. Uh, at its core, we are creating a very simple way to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere by accelerating the rate at which certain rocks naturally take up CO2. So what you see on this slide uh, on the left is carbonate rocks and on the right is a powdered carbonate mineral. So what we do is we spread this powder out to maximize the exposed surface area to ambient air, and we use these minerals in a cyclic process to repeatedly capture CO2. So when looking for high quality carbon removal, there are several key criteria that we need to meet. First, low cost. Additional, meaning that the approach actually removes more CO2 from the atmosphere than would be removed if the approach was not implemented. It needs to be verifiable, it needs to be scalable, have low land area requirements, and it needs to keep CO2 away from the atmosphere in a manner intended to be permanent. We believe that a high quality carbon removal system has to satisfy all of these dimensions as well as, as more criteria that aren't listed on this slide. Um, so looking across all of the different solutions, we noticed that none of them check every box. Reforestation and afforestation require large amounts of arable land and additionality varies from project to project. Additionally, the CO2 is emitted decades down the road as the trees decay. Uh, BECs or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage requires lots of arable land. Soil carbon struggles with verifiability alongside permanence. Carbon mineralization can require significant land and depending on the approach can be very hard to verify. Um, so one of the advantages to direct air capture is that it satisfies every one of these boxes except costs. So this is where we see opportunity. We can drive down the cost of direct air capture by using carbon mineralization as the capture mechanism. So what we do is we combine the nature or natural process of carbon mineralization with the engineered approach for direct air capture uh, to get us what we call a no compromise uh, carbon removal approach. So now that we've talked a little bit about how we see the benefit of this type of process, how does Heirloom's looping process work? So as I mentioned, Heirloom's direct air capture process uses naturally available earth abundant minerals, namely limestone or calcium carbonate to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. So in our process, we start with calcium carbonate rock, which is fed into an electric high temperature reactor. At temperatures of around 900 degrees Celsius, the calcium carbonate breaks down into two component parts, CO2 and calcium oxide. Uh, the produced CO2 is captured and can be stored geologically. The calcium oxide is highly reactive with CO2 at atmospheric conditions. So what this means is that we can lay the material out in engineered structures that facilitate the passive contact of the material to air. Um, essentially, it maximizes the exposed surface area. And inside these contactors, the material naturally uptakes CO2 to reform calcium carbonate. This process typically occurs on the timescale of months to years, but Heirloom has accelerated this process to occur in less than two weeks. After the calcium carbonate has been reformed, it can be fed back into that high temperature reactor, uh, once again, decomposing into CO2 and calcium oxide. And this time the CO2 captured is directly removed from the air. So the process can then continue in this cyclic fashion. So 
from the heirloom process, we get a pure compressed stream of CO2 and we have to do something with that CO2. So there are several different options for how we can permanently and durably store the CO2 for thousands and thousands of years. So we can store it in sedimentary reservoirs, which are similar to the formations um, that we currently use to produce oil and gas. We can mineralize it in basalts, which is the approach that Carbfix is currently developing. We can store it in peridotites or serpentinite, which is the approach that 4401 is currently developing. We can store it in saline aquifers, or alternatively, we can utilize the CO2 in building materials through methods such as CO2 curing, uh, which is the approach that Carbon Cure is currently developing. And I guess with that, I'll pass it back back to Max. Thanks, Noah. Um, so you just saw basically how our approach works. This is sort of all the criteria that we care about. I want to talk a little bit about why we think we can get to low cost, which is incredibly, incredibly important for, for direct air capture and carbon dioxide removal more broadly. And then I also want to talk a little bit about our scaling plans and how we think about getting to low cost and how we think about getting to high scale. So the first thing to talk about is sort of why we think we can achieve low cost and, and especially relative to, to, to other CDR approaches. And I think there's a few things that, that Heirloom really benefits from. The, the first is simplicity, right? The, when you think about what this thing is, it's an incredibly simple process. We basically take minerals that want to take up CO2 from the atmosphere and we spread them out on trays. Um, you know, these trays are uh, quite literally in our earliest prototypes, cookie trays, right? These things are, I think that's the best way to conceptualize this. These are just simple trays of minerals laying out exposed to the atmosphere. They're incredibly affordable. They're incredibly abundant. It allows us to take advantage of uh, extremely mature supply chains, extremely mature uh, uh, technology in the mining industry. It allows us to just start with a very, very simple project, product. The second thing is modularity, which is absolutely essential to achieving low cost engineered anything, um, right? When you, think about, uh, when you think about the difference between building a Ferrari and a Camry, we want to build something that is manufacturable in a factory off an assembly line. Um, what we're doing is we're designing a system that removes CO2 from the atmosphere in a highly modular way, right? We, we want to build these things in uh, uh, um, you know, millions of these things, not 10 at a time. And, and so what our technology allows us to do is achieve high modularity and therefore a high learning rate in a factory-like setting. And the last thing is technical maturity. Um, we are pulling together, we are aggregating a bunch of technologies that are effectively off the shelf industrial automation technologies for a bunch of different uh, industries. Those include, again, as I just described, automotive manufacturing, agriculture, mining, and warehouse automation. These are things that humans have, have gotten very good at driving to low cost over the last decade. And we get to, you know, at many decades, and we get to borrow a lot of that technolo technology and just integrate it in a new process, which is a huge advantage when you think about the slope of the cost curve, the learning rate that we can achieve with this technology. And so what we, what we envision is a world where carbon farms um, like ours, like these deployments of heirloom, just sit on the side of the road, much like you see solar and, and, and wind farms. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be driving along the road, uh, a long drive in the countryside, and, and eventually you'll, you'll drive by an heirloom carbon farm. Um, and, and we're building the platform that can enable that. Uh, to give you sort of a sense of the, the scale of these things, even at a billion tons, we're talking about less than the land area of Disney World to remove a, a billion tons of CO2 per year. So um, that's something we as humans have decided is, is worthy of, uh, you know, a, a sort of reasonably small land area to go and have fun at, at a Disney World. It also feels like it's very, very worth it to, to build a series of, uh, uh, you know, heirloom deployments that can remove a billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere here each year. The, the path to a billion tons is, um, is quite aggressive um, and it's going to be very, very challenging to do this. You know, to, to give a sense of scale, the, I think this is a good, uh, a good analogy here. The entire oil and gas industry extracts about 4 billion tons of mass of fluid from the earth each year. Um, we wanna do a quarter of that in the opposite direction in less than an eighth of the time it took the oil and gas industry to grow. 
It's incredibly, incredibly aggressive, but we think we have a, a clear path to get there. And, and what that means is, you know, we are starting at about a thousand tons per year right now. Um, we need to hit low millions of tons by 2025, 2026, 2027, tens of millions of tons by the end of the decade, and then really double from there, um, double to, you know, every single year to get to a billion tons by the 2035 timeframe. And so where are we at right now? We, uh, we've spent sort of the, the 2019-2020 timeframe really validating the science, making sure that at lab scale, we can accelerate the uptake of CO2 into these minerals in a way that will achieve an economic direct air capture system. And we did that, um, sort of passed that with flying colors, thanks to Noah and, and his team who have done an amazing, amazing job accelerating that carbonation rate. The last year, um, we focused on developing and designing the system that we will go deploy at a thousand tons per year. And now uh, at, over this year and, and, and sort of into next year, we're focused on moving from that feasibility stage to into our first full deployment. And so what that means is put this thing out in the real world at a thousand tons per year, show that it works in a representative environment, put this thing in a, in a position that show us that this is a technology that can meaningfully meaningfully slow climate change over uh, you know over the next couple of decades. So that's where we're at right now. That's what our core focus is on at the moment, making sure that this thing works at a thousand tons per year. We're super excited about that. We'll have a lot more to share, uh, a lot more details to share about that in the next couple of months. But very very excited about this one. The other thing I'll call out here is um, we we can't do this alone. We need a uh, you know we need a large and and durable market for, for carbon removal to make this happen. Um, we are, you know, absolutely thrilled to be, uh, to be partnering with some of the, some of the largest voluntary buyers of carbon removal in the world, some of the earliest and, and um, uh, most willing buyers of carbon removal. Um, we're working with Shopify and Stripe and Sourceful, Klarna, Milky Wire. These carbon removal credits that they're buying, they are, they are paying us to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And, and that's really the core of our business. Um, this is what allows us to get to scale. It allows us to start churning the, the commercial viability of, of our process. Um, we'll start with voluntary customers like these. Eventually, we'll shift to companies that are compelled by policy to reduce the intensity of their carbon emissions. Those hard to abate sectors, like I was talking about early, <clears throat> earlier. And eventually to, uh, you know, to anyone, anywhere, um, when, when we can achieve truly low cost, it will be affordable to remove CO2 from the atmosphere for, for really anyone in the world. And that's, that's really our goal. Um, the last thing I'll talk about here, and, and then we can turn it over to questions, is, um, is just around our path to, to low cost and, and what, this, what this curve looks like, how we'll actually go, go ahead and achieve this. Um, we basically have a, a, a multi-phase approach. Um, at each of these phases, we, we really dramatically increase the scale and decrease the cost. Um, at first, today, we're building hand-built, custom, highly instrumented plants. This is sort of, to use the, the Tesla analogy, our roadster. Um, it is more expensive than it will be in the future, highly customized, um, but it gives us the, the framework. It gives us the platform to learn and to start driving costs down and to start driving volume up. So low volume, high price to start but it allows us a, a chance to start automating. It allows us a chance to start learning, improving our process and driving costs down. In phase two, we're looking at sort of, you know, uh, a, much more, a much more reasonable price target. We're talking about 200 to $1,000 per ton, um, talking about moving to hundreds of thousands to, to millions of tons per year. And eventually to hit that, uh, that sort of sub $100 per ton mark in the, in the tens of millions and, and, and billions of tons. Um, our, Earliest customers, uh, you know, supporters like uh, like Open Air pushing policy that that enables real market enablement at a you know at a federal and state and international level are absolutely essential to to helping us move down our cost curve. Um, the demand side of this is just cannot be understated. Um, we can go build this thing, but if there's nobody to nobody to offtake it, if there's nobody to actually buy these removals and and pay for it, we won't get anywhere. And so. Um, this is a this is a hugely important point that that I will leave you all on. Um, you know, we think we can achieve low cost. We have the technology to do it. We have a steep learning curve to get there, and and we need uh, we need everyone's help to make that happen. Um, 
and that's it. Thank you so much for uh, for listening to us and uh, excited to hear some questions. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Noah. That was a really fantastic presentation. And um, really, I love the way that you really drilled down into how you're going to get to the gigaton and how you're going to get to the, the learning and the cost curve reduction. So that's, that's fantastic. We always like to start to talk a little bit about the, you as individuals and, and you, we heard your bios, but can you talk a little bit more about how each of you came to carbon removal, like how the idea occurred, you know, when did you first learn about it and what made you decide to work on it? Um, how heirloom, how all this sort of like uh, hall of fame set of advisors came together to help you form this company um, and, and maybe a little bit about how, if the idea has changed at all since you first thought of it and also where did the name come from? A lot of questions. Maybe, maybe I'll, I can kick it off with a little bit about how I got into carbon removal and more in the origin of heirloom and then Max, I'd love for you to take how we came up with the name of the heirloom. Um, so I guess to start off my first experience with carbon capture, albeit point source capture was as a sophomore in undergrad. Um, I knew about climate change and some of the projected impacts, but it was my first real experience kind of providing or applying my engineering tool set to a problem that I felt like mattered for society. Um, the next year I had the opportunity and also the honor to take Jen Wilcox's carbon capture class and was exposed to everything carbon from carbon capture, transport, storage, removal, um, and I loved it. So the following year, I ended up working with Jen in her lab, starting with mineralization and then moving more into direct air capture, um, which kind of plays directly into the origin of the initial magnesium oxide looping paper and in the basis for heirloom. So I followed Jen to do my PhD at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which later kind of turned into the University of Pennsylvania. But during my first year, uh, Professor Peter Kellerman at Columbia reached out to Jen and asked, about a new concept for direct air capture that would leverage carbon mineralization. The thought process was if we can decompose carbonates to oxides and leave them exposed to air, they naturally reform carbonates. So why not just decompose carbonates, lay them out to recarbonate, recollect them and decompose them again as a, a very simple way to approach direct air capture. And this eliminates a lot of the major capital costs on the front end for these engineered contactor structures. And it also eliminates a lot of that front-end energy requirements or nearly all of the front-end energy requirements. So we crunched the numbers, did some preliminary techno-economics and it worked out. Um, the concept that's actually outlined in Nature Communications uh, details an approach using magnesium carbonates that are decomposed, laid out, stirred using industrially available farming equipment um, and then regenerated using an oxy-fueled combustion process which requires natural gas and produces extra CO2. So, the, the process caught Shashank's eye, who's our current CEO. Um, he was in conversations with the Grantham Foundation that originally funded some of the early research efforts at the university level. And we had several conversations and after a thorough landscape search, uh, Shashank kind of agreed that this was the most promising approach and the one that he wanted to put his effort towards. So that was kind of the conception of heirloom. Um, since then, heirloom has made several modifications to our process, uh, which are important to highlight we pivoted from using magnesium carbonates to calcium carbonates as they're more earth abundant, they're lower cost, they carbonate more quickly. Although we are designing the process to be kind of carbonate agnostic where we can just tune specific parameters depending on what type of feedstock we'd like to use. Um, we also are using this passive air contactor structure which means that the material is better exposed, we're more efficiently utilizing it and also it allows for easier recollection of the material. So it's, it's no longer laid across the surface of the earth, which was the original conception. Um, and then finally, I think one of the other key points to mention is that the regeneration process we use leverages renewable electricity and does not require fossil fuels. Um, so I think those are kind of the main changes um, from a process perspective um, from this initial conception to where heirloom is today. Um, hand it over to Max to kind of talk more. Thanks, Noah. Um... Yeah, my uh, my journey into to heirloom was was a little bit different. I, I took a bit more of a winding path. I, you know, I, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, which if anybody is familiar with, it's um, frankly one of the more stunning natural uh, places in the world. The, the it's the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and um, my literally my backyard was was the mountains, and so I uh, just grew in uh, a 
clear love for, for nature and, and uh, have never been able to shake that. Um, I also come from uh, a family that is steeped in sustainability. My, my mom is a sustainable urban developer um, in, in Africa. My dad has worked in community solar for a long time. Um, and, and Boulder is also home to both NOAA and NIST. So I've been hearing about global warming around the dinner table since I was a small, small child. Um, uh, you know, since before it was climate change. And it was, you know, deeply embedded in me that this was a, a problem that, um, you know, we as a sort of millennials would face throughout our lives. And I think I, I never recognized it as a career opportunity. So out, coming, out of, coming out of school, I had studied math and um, the sort of, you know, the clear career trajectories were into you know, banking or technology and banking was not interesting to me at all. So I ended up in technology and building software. And, and I absolutely loved that. I loved building software, loved building hardware and robotics. It was incredibly interesting, but frankly, the turning point for me was the 2018 IPCC report. I read it to cover to cover and just, um, I, I quite literally found myself waking up every morning. And the very first thought I had was how, what am I going to do about climate change? Just every single morning. And so I quit my job. I actually moved down to South America to try to figure out what to do, do a little soul searching, ended up working on a, a couple of sustainable, uh, sustainable circular farms in, in Chile and um, then COVID hit. So I came back to the US and, and really went on a search to figure out what the next phase of my career was. And thankfully was introduced to Noah and Shashank um, just around the time that they, uh, you know, they had, had made some major milestones and major breakthroughs in the lab that, that sort of told us that we could actually go commercialize this thing, that it would be profitable um, at, at, at a meaningful scale. And so um, I feel so so lucky to have met them at the time I, I did, um, but jumped on board immediately. And it's been an absolute joy growing this team uh, and company from, from just a few of us. But um, I'll answer the, the name question. The name's an interesting one. Uh, if for, for anybody familiar with naming a company, it's uh, extremely difficult to come up with a name. Uh, you know, we spent hours together brainstorming every possible, every possible name you could imagine. We had hundreds down on, uh, I guess this was, you know, very much peak COVID. So we were all remote sitting on a Zoom call trying to figure out how, what, what to do here. We had them all in a Google sheet and, um, and someone, uh, actually my, my wife from behind me in the room said, what about heirloom? Uh, wow. she was she was reading a, a, it's an interesting story. She was reading a book about, uh, about gardening in San Francisco and she was in the heirloom tomato section. <laughs> um, she said, what about heirloom? And the, you know, the definition of an, the non-tomato definition of an heirloom is an ob a precious object passed down from generation to generation. And it just immediately stuck. Um, it was very clearly, uh, you know, the, it, it represented our, our ethos for, for this business and, and stuck immediately. Um, it was, you know, the, the earth is the ultimate heirloom. It is the thing we are passing down from generation to generation. And it is one that is absolutely worth protect, protecting and, and preserving and restoring. So that's where the name comes from. That's fantastic. I did not, I had read part of the sort of meaning of the name, but I did not know the specific that someone from the back of the room, namely your wife, <laughs> What about Erlen? That is a fantastic contribution. Um, it is. <laughs> I just put a couple of links in the chat. This is something we always talk about on, on when we have DAC folks on to this is CBR. Um, and you guys are really the poster childs, I would say, of uh, modularity and what Peter Miner at Carbon 180 called DAC 2.0. Um, and we've talked a lot about it, but um, maybe just briefly recap the Peter Miner's DAC 2.0, I think is really insightful. Number one, passive air content contact to reduce the energy expenditure of, of, of getting air through whatever your sorbent or solvent is. Number two, modular, both in terms of your form factor. And also, we didn't really talk about this so much, but on the parts in the supply chain, um, trying to use you know existing supply chains and leverage those. And number three, which you guys are really um, doing in space beyond chemical sorbents. Do you have any quick comments on, on those ideas, modularity, and, and anything that you didn't cover that you might want to speak to uh, on, that, on that topic? No, I take it away. Awesome. Yeah, I guess. So we talked a little bit about the passive air contactor and how it eliminates the front end energy requirements and also allows for that good material to air contact with limited capital investment. I think modularity is a really interesting topic. Um, designing for modularity and not even the just the entire system, but the pieces parts that make up that system allows us to reuse consistently the same manufacturing process. 
So from plant to plant, from design to design, we can essentially expand manufacturing, which also helps drive down costs. So that's a really important facet of modularity that I, I don't think it's, it's talked about quite as much. Um, and then your point on supply chains is also really interesting. So particularly with heirlooms process, the two biggest contributions are steel and limestone. And those are two of the largest commodity supply chains um, for our global society. So where we see is that there's this incredible opportunity for innovation within existing supply chains, which is something that heirlooms definitely capitalized on there. Um, the other thing that I like to point out is moving beyond chemical sorbents, which is another, another part of, of Peter's carbon uh, 180 post. Um, we use carbonates. Our feedstock is something that you can take directly from the earth with minimal processing and can use and even return to the earth if we, if we so wanted to. Um, so moving beyond the chemical sorbents allows us to tap into those supply chains and also eliminates the need for this kind of new and innovative approach to developing these engineered synthetic sorbents. So I think those are the pieces that I would highlight. I don't know if Max has anything to add. That's a great summary. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, yeah, I did. I think it, you, you did cover it, but I think it, some of these things bear repeating. And a lot of DAC companies are kind of working on different aspects of this, but I think that you're kind of the purest manifestation of, of these concepts in terms of the uh, what, who's in the market. So it, it's, I think it's really important. Finally, just a quick two part, semi quick two part question, because um, we have a ton of audience questions. Um, number one, can you talk about it? Like, what is a scale heirloom plant? whether it's 2025 or 2030, is it a megaton? Like what size is it? Um, what would it look like? How much space would it occupy? What would it be like for the people who live nearby? Like what would it, would there be a lot of trucks? Would there be fumes? Would there be contaminants? Would there be noise? Would there be, you know, would the earth shake? Um, to talk about that. And then number two, like given what a scale heirloom plant is like. How do you think about engaging with the surrounding communities? Um, it's something we've really started to ask. It's really, like our thinking on this is really informed by um, Holly Buck, who was on a couple weeks ago and who is, I think, one of the perfect people to kind of frame these questions. But as we build out this industry, we have the fossil economy has done so much harm to so many people. Like we have an opportunity to do it right. So like, and I know you guys have talked about this and thought about this, but can you share with the audience, number one, what do you look like at scale? And then number two, how do you relate to the surrounding communities, you know, in advance and then once you're operating? Yeah, great questions. So I'll take the first one on, on scale here. So, you know, realistically, the way we envision scaling this technology is around injection. Injection is an essential constraint on how big a particular deployment can be. Um, right, the, the injectivity of a particular location varies dramatically based on the geological structure underneath that, you know, underneath that particular site. So the, the main constraining factor for us on a, on a given site is just how much CO2 could we, could, could we conceivably inject underground per year on that site. When we think about modularity of our system, Noah talked a little bit about modularity on a, on a micro scale, right? It's like, how do, you, how do you think about the individual module that is a single air contactor, a single tray, um, a single regeneration unit? But what's also important is how we actually structure those in a way that we can manufacture, bolt to the ground, and, uh, and duplicate. And so when we think about a, a sort of a deployment module, we think about these in, on the scale of sort of 10,000 tons per year. An individual module is a series of air contactors and a regeneration unit that we can just bolt to the ground and, and, and go plug in and turn it on, start removing CO2. So when you talk about like a, a, a million ton plant, it's actually a series of many of these deployment modules deployed in parallel. Um, the land use is quite small. So, um, you know, for uh, a million ton plant, we're talking about 30-ish acres, something like that. Um, for a 10,000, you know, that individual uh, deployment module, we're talking about half the size of a football field. Um, to give you just some context on, on what the size of these things are, are, are like. They are fully automated systems. Um, so the, the materials handling uh, that is moving, moving the media, the minerals back and forth between the air compactor and the, the regeneration unit is entirely automated. It's extremely quiet. Um, you have uh, people on site working at these plants from a maintenance and operations perspective. Um, you know, we will never, never automate away, uh, in, you know, the entirety of, uh, of this process, but um, the goal is to reduce cost by, by leveraging automation as, as much as possible. Um, 
there is some logistics associated with it. We, we, we need some, you know, makeup material of, of carbonate minerals over time. So every once in a while, we'll bring in a truckload or a train load of, of carbonate material. But for the most part, this thing is relatively self-contained, in particular if we're on site with injection. Um, when we talk about sort of the, the workforce piece, um, it, it's not just the workforce that operates this plant that's relevant. There's also, uh, you know, jobs in mining and operations and maintenance and engineering and manufacturing. Manufacturing is a huge job creator here for us, um, especially regionally. You know, we need to manufacture enormous quantities of these things to get to a billion tons. And so um, that's a that's a long, long term, stable um, form of employment and workforce development that we're really interested in um, in developing. The, the sort of the second part of your question is around the, around policy and community engagement, which we think is just an incredibly important question. Um, you know, what the. <laughs> I, I think this is this is so relevant. The name we originally incorporated this business under was not Heirloom. It was originally it was originally called Equiops, and and what that means is it stands for Equitable Opportunities. And um, quite literally, you know, as deep as you can go in the bones of this company, the the reason we are the reason we are building a company to remove CO two from the atmosphere is because climate change hits the most vulnerable people that are least responsible for climate change the hardest. And there's no doubt about that. And removing CO2 from the atmosphere anywhere affects everybody. Um, and so that's this great, this, it is the ultimate way to affect equ equitability, equity on earth. And we care deeply about that. And so we care about that on, an, uh, you know, on a global basis, we care about it on a regional basis, and we care about it on the local level as well. We care a lot about how, how these deployments influence and impact the people um, you know, the people nearby them. So I can talk very specifically about our, our first couple of deployments and how we're thinking about community engagement there, which I think is probably at least the most relevant here. It is a direct, uh, a very direct and clear way that we are engaging with communities. Um, we, I, I won't share too many details, but we are planning on deploying in California. Um, and so there are two ways we're thinking about this. We're thinking about, uh, you know, communication and engagement at a state level and then at the local level. And so at the state level, you know, the primary body that regulates air in California is the Care California Air Resource Board. Um, they host public workshops, um, in particular with environmental justice groups from around the state um, and uh, in Kern County in the Bay Area. We are uh, active participants in those. Um, we, you know, we aim to, to sort of make our process and our deployment strategy as transparent as possible. We want to educate people about what we are trying to accomplish. We want to make help people become comfortable with this brand new thing, right? This is an industrial process. It's infrastructure. It is a it is a scary thing to have if you don't know about it. Um, you know, in reality, what we're building is extremely safe. Um, it is a, a relatively, it's actually an extremely simple process. It is rocks. They are non-toxic. Um, it's a safe thing to go do, but we want to make sure people understand what is what is this process that we are doing? What are we introducing to their community? Make sure that people just feel comfortable with it and are aware of it. I think that's the first that's the first step is just educate people about what we're trying to accomplish. We don't want to we don't want to hide this. We don't want to we don't want to obfuscate what we're working on. I think it's a big that that has been a big problem in the oil and gas industry is just putting these putting things that harm communities behind walls and not telling them what's going on. Um, we just want to avoid that at all costs. We want to be transparent and open and honest about what we're trying to accomplish. That's the first piece. Engage with environmental justice communities. Make sure that we are educating community, communities where we are going to deploy these and start to think a lot about um, uh, workforce development and job opportunities in the areas that we're, we're deploying. And then on a local level, um, you know, that, that's statewide. When we think about the local level, we are thinking much more, uh, much more concretely about the areas we are actually deploying in. And so what I mean by that is when we go put this stuff out in the real world, we are in some, literally in people's neighborhoods, right? We are, uh, we are close by. These people are going to see it. They are going to experience it. They are going to understand sort of uh, that this is a thing. This is a large thing that is in their community. And so we wanna make sure that we are much more sort of focused, engaged with those local communities. And so examples of, of communities that we are, um, we are engaging with are of course, planning departments, uh, environmental departments. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, 
again, I won't go into too much specificity because we haven't shared exactly where we are deploying, but specifically the, you know, the departments that are responsible for ensuring uh, climate justice and equity in the in the community at a city level, we are we are engaging with them on a on a very very regular basis. We're talking about talking about the agencies that um, handle all you know uh, zoning, environmental justice, workforce development criteria. Um, we're engaged with uh, you know the presidents of the districts of uh, uh, the districts where we will be located. Uh, we're meeting with citizen groups, things like neighborhood booster groups, neighborhood associations, citizen advisory committees, making sure that we are not just sharing what we are doing, but we are understanding community concerns, making sure that there is a shared dialogue. It is not just us telling people what we are doing. We also want to understand what people are worried about. We wanna learn from that. We wanna shape our technology and our deployment strategy around the things that people care about and the things that people worry about. So um, that's, you know, that is absolutely essential. We will, we are focused primarily on the areas we are deploying today, but as we start to expand, that's going to be a core focus area of us, both from a policy perspective and a community engagement perspective. Um, we, you know, we need to be involved in these communities and we need to make sure that we are giving back and understanding and making sure that there is, you know, there are positive benefits outside of just cleaning up the air. Um, there's, there's a lot more that we can do than, than, than just that. Great. That's a fantastic, really inspiring answer. And I'm glad that you are thinking about it in that way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to flip it over to Dahl. Um, we have 65 audience questions. We're, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but um, we are going to extend by maybe five minutes. So we have a solid 15 minutes of audience Q&A. So go Dahl. All right. Thank you, Toby. And thank you, presenters. Um, our first audience question uh, happens to be um, something that's been repeated several times. Uh, there's a high interest in the energy requirements for the processing in your high temperature reactor. Specifically, can you tell us more about what you're doing for heat and energy in general for your process, especially the reactor, which is running at 900 degrees Celsius? Yeah, so I guess I, I can take that one. So the methodology in which we're heating the material is, you know, very similar to cement and lime production today. We decompose the calcium carbonate into the calcium oxide, which is ubiquitous uh, in certain industries. So the minimum energy required for heating and decomposing that material is about 4.9 gigajoules per ton. Uh, currently, we're a little bit higher than that on account of inefficiencies inside of the system, but ultimately Heirloom's goal is to get to less than 1500 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2 in our regeneration system. So that includes working with industrial suppliers today to kind of innovate on what is the state of the art and what is standard. Um, so uh, it's a little bit, I can't share too much about uh, into the details of the actual process configuration, but the energy requirements and the target. Um, all right, thank you so much, Noah. Um, our next audience question is from uh, Corey Myers. Um, he says he believes Heirloom originally proposed using magnesium carbonate. What made you switch to calcium carbonate? That's a great question. Um, so as, as I kind of mentioned, Heirloom is uh, designing the process to be agnostic to the carbonate material so that we can kind of tweak certain process parameters and be able to use calcium, magnesium, dolomite, which is calcium and magnesium. But the reason that we're focusing on calcium carbonate to begin with is because of, there's actually several factors. The first one being calcium carbonate is lower cost and much more earth abundant than magnesium carbonate. So calcite makes up about 4%, well, four to 12%, depending on where you look of the earth's crust, um, which means that it's widely accessible in a lot more locations than magnesium carbonate. The second aspect of this is that calcium carbonate is actually much faster at reacting with the CO2 in air. So we can actually accelerate carbonation rates a little bit further using calcium as opposed to magnesium. Um, the third piece of this is um, has to do with water of hydration. So calcium oxide, calcium hydroxide, calcium carbonate is kind of the reaction pathway for calcium-based materials, whereas magnesium likes to hold on to its water. So you get hydrous magnesium carbonates like nesquahelonite or hydromagnesite. And while there are some indication that you can dehydrate them at very low energy requirements, it does add energy to the system uh, that's not offset by the fact that magnesium has a lower calcination temperature than calcium. So that was, that was the initial reasoning for the switch from magnesium to calcium. Mm, wonderful, thank you so much. 
I'm going to switch a bit to a slightly policy related question. Um, don't want to take up too much time with technical ones for you, but um, Deborah Halla asks, beyond education and jobs, do you have any thoughts about structures that allow marginalized communities to benefit financially or to share in the profits from your technology? Yeah, that is a, a fantastic question. And I think um, <clears throat> for anyone who is familiar with the, the DOE RFI that uh, was, was just, I guess, just completed, just closed for, for the direct air capture hubs. There's a lot of conversation around this. Um, you know, I think there are, you know, there are clear ways that uh, communities can benefit uh, financially, economically from, um, you know, from these deployments, whether that be, uh, you know, percentages of revenue going back to uh, communities that we deploy in, uh, whether there are sort of opportunities for shared ownership, um, you know, in other words, uh, a community where we deploy to have some some percentage equity in a particular project in that project that's deployed with them, so they have ownership over the credits associated with that. Um, there are you know five or six or, or seven different ways that the DOE is 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 thinking about um, is thinking about this. We transparently need to do a, a lot more research and and um, and, and understand what. What, what the actual impacts to these communities will be um, from each of those different economic structures, financial structures, um, to really have a clear answer on that. I think this is such a, uh, a new industry and a new idea that we don't have a firm perspective on that. The thing I will share is that, you know, we, we want to, we definitely want to find ways that um, there are, you know, financial and economic incentives, uh, benefits to these communities, for for hosting us, uh, uh, you know, for hosting this technology, and that it it that that this is a uh, you know this is this does actually build equity in, instead of just having another piece of infrastructure in in, in your neighborhood. And so um, I don't have a clear answer on exactly what the right structure is for that, but we are uh, you know eager to to sort of pursue a bunch of different op options and and do the do the research to figure that out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, our next audience question is from Nick Renard. Uh, he asks, do you see mandatory markets as a necessity to enable you to grow and bring costs down below $100 per ton? So that's a, that's a tough question. My, my short answer would be yes. I think that um, there have to be regulated markets that, uh, that obligate heavy emitting industries to uh, you know, in some way reduce their emissions. And in, in particular, you know, I think making direct air capture an eligible sort of allowance or credit generator in those markets is a great market enablement tool for, for direct air capture. There are other ways you can do this, right? I think, um, you know, open air is pushing state government procurement, which is another example of a non-mandatory compliance obligation for businesses, but it is a way that society can bear the cost, particular, you know, uh, the, the global north and, uh, and western hemisphere can bear the cost of removing CO2 that we have emitted. Um, so there are a number of different structures. I wouldn't say they are mandatory, but they are clearly the, uh, as of today, the favored policy mechanism to drive market enablement for direct air capture and carbon dioxide removal. So from that perspective, you know, I think the best way to think about it is if we want to figure out a way to pay for five to 10 billion tons of CO2 removal per year, by 2050, we need institutions the size of large governments or you know, all of society to bear that cost. And so um, you know, it's not just going to be a few small tech businesses that pay for this. It's going to be a huge, huge group of intergovernmental organizations, governments, and, and heavy emitting industries that, that bear the cost of this. Wonderful. Thank you again, Max. Uh, we have a lot of audience questions. We're just going to go through a few um, that have been uh, uh, sent in. Um, for This one's from Jeffrey Greenspan. Um, how does the form of the carbon stored impact the amount that the soil or um, that, that you're applying can absorb and also the duration of sequestration? So depending on the form of carbon that you are actually producing, uh, you mentioned a pure stream, but do you have any other forms that you're using? Um, from the process, yeah, we produce the pure stream of CO2, so primarily focused on storage, geologic storage, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, permanent utilization, like in CO2 curing for concrete, 
So those are kind of the the two two pathways that we've considered up until this point. I don't know, Max, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I think the thing I will share there, um, just around the question of sort of utilization versus versus geological storage, uh, you know, when you think about um, I guess Noah, Noah just mentioned this, but we produce, you know, our, our process produces a pure stream of CO2. We have to do something with that pure stream of CO2, sort of regardless of how you store it geologically, at least within the confines of the, you know, the the um, uh, the ways, the, the pathways that Noah shared earlier, they are, they have slightly different costs associated with them. They have, um, you know, different monitoring and verification challenges associated with them. But for the most part, those are not for the most part, totally, those are, um, you know, permanent geological storage. When we talk about utilization versus geological storage, the um, you know the, the thing to think about is utilization is interesting. Permanent utilization is a very interesting uh, you know way for us to sequester CO two, and I think concrete in particular is really interesting because it's not just a way to store CO two; it is also a way to increase value in the concrete uh, in the concrete market. Right? You create uh, stronger concrete, lighter concrete, lower cost. Um, and, and better value for that industry. So there is, a, there is both an economic benefit to the, to the sort of demand side of that CO2, and there is also a climate benefit in storing that CO2 in concrete. So that's a very, very interesting utilization market. That said, there's only 5 billion tons of concrete produced every year, and CO2 injected into concrete is a small fraction of that, 5 or 10%. And so you can't get, and, and, and that, by the way, is the largest uh, mass produced of any individual object on earth by humans. Um, and so there are, there's not enough stuff produced by people to sequester all of that CO2. So we need some element of geological sequestration and a significant percentage, we think, over the long run of our CO2 will go underground because of that. Um, so I think just to put that sort of frame of reference on utilization versus geological storage, they are both permanent stores of CO2. They both take a very, you know, a very similar pure stream of CO2, but um, they, uh, yeah, they are, um, you know, Slightly, slightly different use cases. Wonderful. Thank you again, Max. Yeah. Um, we're going to run a little bit over. We have about five minutes of uh, more of audience questions, and then we'll return it back to Toby. Um, so another question is um, asked by Corey Myers. This is a more technical one. Cement is made from decomposing calcium, calcium carbonate to CO2, and then naturally recarbonates to the calcium carbonate when exposed to the air. Can you help him see where the additional CDR occurs? Absolutely. So I, I think the main departure there, I guess actually taking a step back, when cement or concrete carbonates um, after being built is actually degradation to the material. So it is, it's a negative impact. And the cement process and concrete production processes are actually engineered such that that does not occur to such an extent that it reduces the viability of the building material. So it, it's something that's actively avoided. However, distinguishing heirloom from this kind of recarbonation process is that we repeatedly cycle our calcium carbonate, calcium oxide material. So after this first recarbonation, sent back to the high temperature reactor, it's decomposed again, the CO2 is captured, the same material is laid out to uptake more CO2. And we can do this over tens, tens of cycles to hundreds of cycles, we're still figuring out the limit of the material. Um, very promising that the degradation actually allows us to go much further than the initial 10 cycles that we thought we could do. Um, and in, in repeatedly cycling that material, we're actually getting more utility or more CO2 removal per unit calcium carbonate that we put into the system. So there's significant additionality in the fact that we've gone, we're repeatedly capturing CO2 with the same material. So you can think of the carbonate oxide system similar to solid sorbent direct air capture where you're cycling the sorbents to capture and release CO2 uh, in a manner that is definitively additional. Um, additionally, redundant, but additionally, we can also measure how much CO2 we've captured from the air by simple flow meter on the outside of or the tail end of the process. And that allows us to directly quantify how much CO2 we're actually capturing as a function of the process. Thank you, Noah. Um, we have another uh, audience question from Daniel Bell Moran. Uh, is deployment intended specifically for industrial hubs or is this something you think might be integrated into building decarbonization? So 
When we think about deployment, um, we have to think about a bunch of overlapping criteria. Um, and it's, it's not purely about, the, the deployment strategy is not purely about industrial decarbonization. The deployment strategy is sort of decoupled from these, right? So direct air capture, when, when you remove CO2 from the atmosphere, CO2 is well mixed in the atmosphere. So you know, removing CO2 in California affects the air in Europe. Um, that's a great, uh, it's a great quality of direct air capture. It doesn't matter where we are. That said, when we think about where we actually place these things, it's important that we are near a carbonate source. It is important that we are near low cost 24 seven firm renewable power. And it's important that we are near uh, an injection site or a place that can take our CO2. In other words, uh, concrete production. So we, we don't think about putting these in industrial hubs per se. We think about the cost uh, the, the total cost of the system in a particular region, in a particular area. Um, and so there are all sorts of over, sort of overlapping and intertwined factors there that we need to consider. But you know, deploying close to an urban area that has a lot of construction with concrete going on, that's a great way for us to just sort of have a consistent uh, demand source for that CO2 injected into concrete. Similarly, sitting directly on top of a geological injection site is a great place for us to be because you don't have to transport that CO2, you don't lose CO2 along, that, along the way, and you don't pay for that transport. And so for us, it's a question of um, sort of the overall cost of the system rather than focusing specifically on industrial hubs or urban areas. Each location you know, that we might deploy has a different cost associated with it, and, and we need to think about that as, you know, as part of our strategy. Well, thank you, Max. Um, we are going to wrap up now. Um, we've had so many audience questions and we thank you for your time today. I'm going to turn it back to Toby to, uh, um, to finish up for today. Thank you, Doll. Great job with the Q&A. There were so many. And um, thank you, Max and Noah, um, for being with us. That was a fantastic presentation. And as you can see, our community is extremely excited about what you guys are doing. So, uh, Thank you all for attending. Thank you again to Max and Noah for an excellent presentation. And thank you, Dahl, for um, really doing a great job with the Q&A.